Hello, everyone. I'm Hontim from CHI, and welcome to CHI Innovate 2021. It's a conference series, and we talk about creating a better normal for healthcare. So in today's center stage segment, we are really honored to have with us a leading light in Asia, Ms. Melissa Kui, who is the CEO of the National Volunteer and Philanthropy Center here in Singapore. She's our speaker. And moderating the session will be another great ally and friend of CHI, Dr. Wong Sweet Fun, the Chief Transformation Officer for Yishun Health. Dr. Wong's current work uh, extends way beyond the walls of the hospital to improve population health in the people that are looked after by Yishun Health and the National Healthcare Group. And Sweet Fun describes herself as an avid learner, a self-taught design thinker, and an accidental innovator. But I know her as a consummate connector, a consummate communicator, and a wonderful enabler. So, hi, Sweet Fun. Can you see me? Yes, I can see you, Auntie. Hi, right. hello. Hi, Sweet Fun. Thank you very much for coming to this session. I'm really looking forward to, to the conversation between you and Melissa. All right, over to you then. Right. Good afternoon to everyone who can join us today. Yeah. Before we bring Melissa onto the big screen, I'm really very excited about this. Let me give you a quick introduction on Melissa's background. Melissa is the third CEO of the National Volunteer and Philanthropy Centre. Her career has involved her bridging the public, private and community sector as an anthropologist, researcher, program designer, social innovator, and as a catalyst in the private sector. She has founded, run, and served on the boards of several non-profit organizations and ground up initiatives relating to youth, women, the arts, prisons, community development, healthcare, and education. Today, Melissa will be sharing with us her topic entitled, Still Human, Ways to Emerge Truly Stronger. She will invite us to take a pause, to be present individually and with one another through this reflective space for our varied souls. She will walk us through what we cannot unsee, how to embrace the lessons and challenge us to reimagine a way forward. How can we recover our sense of purpose, perspective and humour to shore up the strength to emerge truly stronger. Let's bring Melissa on stage. Hi, Melissa. Oh, good to see and you. It's great that you can join us here today and we are so looking forward to your sharing and we're not going to waste any more time. The stage is now yours. <laughs> uh, I think really the first thing that I absolutely must say to um, our audience here today is thank you. Um, thank you for the immense uh, work, love, sweat and tears um, that I think you have put into um, helping us to navigate and respond to uh, this enormous challenge that, uh, that we're in right now. So I really just so sincerely want to say thank you. Um, and I, I will be very honest with you, um, when they asked me to speak about uh, innovation and I thought, oh my gosh, well, healthcare is already doing so many amazing things. You know, what, what am I supposed to say actually? And then, then the other, you know, very raw fact hit me too, which was, uh, oh my goodness, everybody must be so totally exhausted. You, you don't want to hear actually anything about uh, why you should innovate or that we need to innovate or anything of that nature. And, um, and so for that reason, um, uh, I decided to also reflect and, and, I, and I thought actually what we need to do is recognize that we do um, experience that fragility and, and frailty and, and tiredness actually ourselves. Um, and, and that we need to just shore up that strength of, of where we are now. Remember that we are still human and it's you know, beautiful and, and fragile dimensions. Um, and then be ready truly to, to, to move forward with, uh, with all that needs to be done. And we all know that too. So 
Uh, I thought what I might do, um, perhaps to just begin the session, is invite us to take a few moments just to be still. Um, and perhaps if we could just pause for a moment, um, what I'd like to do in the, in the time that we have together um, is just share some thoughts, but I would love for you to notice your own thoughts um, and your own responses uh, to what it is that um, I'm gonna share. And, and hopefully in that, take it and marinate it, um, speak about it, reflect on it perhaps with others um, and begin the conversations that will uh, take you forward. So if I could just uh, invite us um, all just to be present, um, to take a seat, to be comfortable um, uh, where you are uh, and just close your eyes or, or um, soften your gaze. Uh, if you could now just take a deep breath in, take a deep breath out. And as you just breathe in, breathe in some joy, strength, and breathe out any tiredness or, or weariness that you have, anything that isn't quite you. And as you do that, just imagine that there is a a warmth and a like warm honey just being poured then from the, from the top of your head, just flowing down um, face to your shoulders, just to relax every part um, that it touches. And in that, as it touches your shoulders, which have borne so much, um, let your shoulders just untense. And as that travels down, just feel your, your stomach. And as you breathe in and out, feel your breath there. And remember that uh, whatever it is that you've had to stomach in the past that you are, you are strong and you are getting through this. And it's time to just relax. And take a moment to just feel the seat. Um, and feel your legs and feel your feet uh, that keep you grounded, that are taking you on that path, that are holding up um, your entire body. Just thank them. Thank them for, for being with you and for carrying you through this. Give thanks for yourself and your whole body. Um, thank, give thanks for your presence here today. I could just quietly um, invite you then just to open your eyes and um, come back. And I wanted to say too, um, that if you're listening to this and you're feeling tired and you would prefer to take a nap, uh, you don't have to turn on your video. So please take a nap <laughs> instead because rest is indeed very, very important. Um, I thought what I might do today is just uh, share something in three parts. Um, the first is some uh, reflections actually that, that, that I've had um, over the last year and a half. The second is just to invite you to reflect on three questions um, and you can you know, get a pen and paper or something together just to, to jot down some of your thoughts on that. And then we're gonna have, I think a conversation just afterwards, which should be lots of fun. So, it was interesting. Um, I've been trying since COVID started to be still. Uh, and I feel like I get those messages to do the opposite of what is happening and whatever I see around me uh, when, thing, when it is very important. And uh, just as, as uh, COVID started to break in, in Singapore um, last, last year, um, there were three things that uh, I felt were very, very critical. And so I told the team, there are three senses that we absolutely must uh, retain. The first is a sense of purpose. We have to know that it will get better and it will get worse. And we have to know why we started and we have to know why we're doing what we do. Let us reflect on our sense of purpose. The second point that, I, that, that came to me was this idea of the sense of perspective. How can we remember um, and actually give thanks for where we are? And I, and I 
I say this, um, you know, as we are now in Singapore, um, saying that actually as difficult as, as our situations may be, I have so many other friends and I'm sure you also have so many other colleagues in other parts of the world um, that are struggling beyond description. And to truly also remember to have that perspective, to remember to give thanks for where, where we are. And of course, lastly, the piece that I think is so critically important and I'm not very good at, I'm not very funny, um, but is also to have a sense of humor that we must remember that as go going through this, we must laugh. We must find things that, that, that lift our spirits. And, and actually I, I wrote, I realized recently that humor um, and sometimes even satire uh, is a way to say something that is very, very difficult to say, um, but can be said in a comedic format. Um, so really there is, there is the humor, there's these layers of humor, I think that we can also uncover in this time. So three senses, a sense of perspective, a sense of purpose and a sense of humor. This, then a couple months later, the, this other piece kind of got uh, downloaded. Um, and there were really just four stages actually that I, that I felt that we were going to go through. The first was really this stage that we would go through if there are, helpful to remember. Revelation, what would we see? What would we see? What would be uncovered? Secondly was repentance, which is a very loaded word, but essentially it, it, it reminds me that, that sometimes we are part of the problem, but usually we, sometimes we are. <laughs> uh, but if we are part of the problem, we are also part of the solution. What is it that we can then um, acknowledge our culpability for? But then flipping to the next point, take responsibility uh, for some of those, those parts. Um, and then in doing that, then reimagine, and I put a little heart there to remind myself that this is where we are now. This is, act, we are actually in that stage uh, where we can begin to reimagine things. We've, we've, we've developed habits over the last two years. We've, we've, we've seen, done, uncovered so much, tried so many different things. Um, we've caught glimpses of the future. How can we amplify uh, those elements and, and then move towards um, what might be really a, a quite a fundamental uh, reset going forward. And uh, as I said, just now, I think it is that time to acknowledge what we cannot say we have not seen, um, to look at what those lessons are really squarely in the eye and, and reimagine uh, that way forward. So the first question um, you might want to consider is what can you now not unsee? And for me, thinking back um, with, uh, with COVID, there was really the, the best and the worst of us. I mean, we all kind of remember, and it wasn't just Singapore, I'm sort of heartened to, 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 to know that had uh, all the supermarket runs and toilet paper ran out, you know, during, during those, those times. Um, and, it was, and it was a, a time when, when really everything that could be shaken um, was shaken and things that were strong uh, strengthened and things that were weak really cracked into to, to pieces. And now we think about that as being relevant to, to businesses that perhaps might have been over leveraged, families where either staying home during circuit breaker is a great time of quality time with, with, with family, or it could be just a horrible um, you know, uh, experience of walking on eggshells all day um, and, and, and experiencing great uh, personal or emotional duress, um, finding, finding friends, looking around us for all of the different weak links um, and really seeing the impact, the differential impact uh, that COVID really had on the last, the least and those who might be considered even lost uh, in the system. And all of these things were, were, were revealed and are continuing to be uh, revealed in this time, impact on seniors, people with um, different abilities, uh, mental health conditions and, and so on. And yet at the same time, there was also the best of us that came out, um, really finding what, being, what was truly essential um, and people coming forward to, to respond with, with, with love and, and with, with kindness. Um, 
and and really everybody from the artists who, even though they were suffering, said, hey, we know the power of arts to lift the human spirit. So let's put those concerts uh, online. Um, and you know, to people who reached out and said, we cannot forget our migrant community amongst us. And um, let's make sure we have that relief and, and uh, outreach there, whether it was digital inclusion for people who uh, didn't have uh, data plans and laptops and anything else when when circuit breaker started and even you know with the incredible generosity that we've had with the with the government we were so surprised on giving.sg which is our digital giving platform that um, right after the solidarity payment which was six hundred dollars to every Singaporean was given um, we had this huge jump when influencers and other social media um, campaigns out there said, ask people to, to give those to, to those in greater need. Um, and our spike there you know, was, 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 uh, was significant. Um, and we did three times more uh, than the last year uh, when that happened. I think the other huge part, and, and this is where I think um, this conference also speaks to too, is, is the, in, the incredible capacity for creativity and innovation that was unleashed um, in the last year's uh, too. Uh, I think perhaps, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, um, but, but my team kind of started from zero to, to, to a site helping to do the matching, for instance, and that's what this is, you know, of, of different cleaning supplies, equipment, uh, PPE, the rest of it, uh, you know, during, during that period of time for the charities and the homes that, that needed it and for the corporate donors and so forth that were there as well too. Um, so much of this is really about trying to facilitate more seamless multi-agency coordination. And so, of course, we asked ourselves, you know, what then is the real heart of Singapore? Um, and for us, you know, we think about Singapore as the city of good. That's our, that's our dream, I suppose. Um, and we say that that's where people, leaders, and organizations come together to give their best uh, for others. Um, so it is less about what one does for oneself and more about what one does for others. The second R was really this notion of responsibility, um, not so much culpability, I think, although there is that dimension of it, but really this idea that we have the ability to respond. And that is necessary as we combat hopelessness, uh, helplessness um, is what we uh, are, are observing sometimes around us too. We also observe anger, but I love the angry people because they still have energy to do something. So one should always engage the the, the angry people, um, you know, in this as well. Um, and what we what we do therefore need is to to, to turn our angry complainers um, into citizens, um, saying that yes, we can do something about that, and it's not always just about who is to blame because perhaps we all are, um, but how do we then take responsibility um, and navigate that way forward? So my second question to you is, what response has led you to discover a new strength or a new ability either within you or around you? And the last stage, uh, or the, the, where maybe where we'll pause, and perhaps where we are now, uh, is this place of reimagining, um, is this place of, of remembering a vision um, and, and helping to codify that, helping to clarify that um, for ourselves um, and, and others. So the third question is, what are you being invited to reimagine today. And I thought I would share um, two examples. One, um, which, was, uh, which was a big idea that didn't happen, but it still is a point that you have to kind of try it, sort of fail, but it kind of turned out differently. Uh, and one, which is another project in, in process, just to help you sort of think about, or at least share with you what we're thinking about in terms of this too. So when, Circuit Breaker, which was our lockdown, happened last year. We realized, this is the bottom corner, that there were about 10,000 students in Singapore who um, were gonna re be receiving their main meals, their main nutrition at school. And when schools closed, how were they going to receive that nutrition and, and support? Um, and 
And so we started to then think and connect across the whole um, system of who, well, who cared, we asked the question, who cared about that? Well, of course, the Ministry of Education cared and, and you know, then, but then citizens and foundations and companies also, also cared too. And, and how might we connect all these different uh, uh, parts of our system from the platforms that were connecting people to the places that were, where food would be cooked and, and prepared, whether that was food courts or, or, or restaurants or catering facilities. Um, how might we bring those different pieces together to, to redesign how these kids actually could have that meal, um, those meals actually for that period of time, recognizing that it was going to be a certain number of weeks and it could be continued. Everything was in flux. How could we redesign a flexible system? How could we also design the system where it wasn't just about somebody taking and somebody giving, but, but what if we could also find a way that, that those who received could also give? Um, and then we thought, you know, that's, what we, that's, that's what's important about this too, is that there isn't just um, uh, somebody becoming a victim of charity through this, but actually an opportunity to respond and to provide the dignity of, of paying it forward, of, of giving back actually too. So how could they perhaps give in time, given other skills and so forth. So we began to sort of reimagine what this whole system um, might look like. And, and even though this particular uh, project failed, um, sort of didn't, didn't uh, um, uh, evolve as, as a sort of initially expected, the problem was actually addressed and, and what it did was unshackle a lot of our, our thinking around what is actually now possible in terms of these flexible alliances um, to move forward as, as and when we, we face different challenges in the future. The other example um, that I thought I'd share is one uh, project from something that we call CoLabs, it's sort of like a collaboration laboratory in a way. Um, and CoLabs was, was created with the intent um, to, well, I guess, pose the question, what do we all feel is possible? What do we all feel is needed that none of us can do alone? What is something that we all feel is needed that none of us can do alone? Um, and and what, we, what we felt actually last year was really the, 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 the great um, neglect in many ways of the migrant, the over almost million person migrant community um, amongst us. And what could we do to um, respond in a way that acknowledged uh, where things were, uh, but at the same time tried to create something uh, better. And so we, so we, so we posed this question, um, how might we uh, uh, create a total quality of life, the live work play experience for migrant workers in Singapore? It wasn't a problem statement. I guess it was a challenge statement, but we tried to make it an aspiration statement, you know, uh, something that, that would draw us into the future. Uh, and so we brought together the whole, all the, about 80 different stakeholders across the system from the government regulators to the dorm operators, to the employers, to the advocacy groups, um, to the policy uh, research people, to the to the other NGOs, to the ground up groups doing all the last mile work. Um, and then some of the migrant workers themselves um, who were, who were uh, community leaders within, within, their, within their, um, their, their dorms and so forth. And um, we all went on this journey to explore how might we actually create that total quality of life. And as a system came together to map out who's in the system, what are the different perspectives that we all have and are coming from? What, what part of the elephant are we groping? Um, how, how might we see the fullness of this, of this elephant? Um, and, and then how, how could we map out the different issues that we're seeing, prioritize them, find what's working now, um, perhaps co-create or refine some, of, some, some new ideas, uh, 
uh, and, and map things forward. And so, you know, things like, for example, uh, adopt the dorm community, um, you know, came out of it. And that was just one, one, of, the, one of the ideas. But this process of, of, of thinking as a whole system together um, is something that has been, uh, I think, has been birthed and accelerated uh, in this system. And it, and it reminds us that none of us are alone. Um, it reminds us that none of us can do it alone. Um, but that, but that really the fellowship and the and the commitment of all of us coming together is what can actually help navigate um, the way forward. And of course, that's always easier said and said than done, um, because so much of this uh, is relational, and really requires uh, building or even rebuilding in some instances uh, trust. Um, and I just share with you a, 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 an equation that we use a lot of times. Um, to understand where things uh, perhaps need to be strengthened. Um, and that is that trust equals credibility, competence, the ability to get things done, um, reliability, uh, the fact that you'll say what you, you know, do what you say and say what you do. Um, uh, and then relational intimacy that we, that we know each other, uh, that there is um, a sense of who you are as a person, who I am as a person, divided by self-interest. So we can note that the, the common or the denominator here is inversely related to, to trust. So the more other centered we are, the perhaps the more someone is likely um, to, to trust us. And, and at the end of the day, ultimately change happens at the speed uh, of trust. So the reflection um, for us perhaps to begin today um, is uh, what need uh, can, can you, uh, that is, is speaking to you? What can you now not unsee? Uh, secondly, is what is the gift that you have to offer? You know, what is that strength or ability that, that you've discovered inside of you? Um, what is one action um, that you might take to be part of reimagining this better future together? Um, and what I'd like to do is just uh, share kind of a video for you to perhaps reflect upon those, uh, those three questions. And I, may I just invite the um, secretary to help us with that. 2020, the year everything changed. No more parties, large gatherings, holidays. In place of them are masks, QR codes, safe distancing, and fear. What good could possibly emerge from a time like this? Plenty. While there are no more buffets, there's more food for those in need. When COVID came, it was a typical reaction. Okay, you're supposed to stop. I said, no, more people need our help. So in fact, we must do even more. We were running on fumes, but we had to move. We are quite affected by it also. Lah. Because since we are already losing money, so much as well, like just do good. Lah. We give up about 80 to 100 females a day. We actually found a way to help two struggling sectors at the same time by raising funds to buy meals from hard-hit FMB establishments and delivering them through our volunteers to needy families. I think the, the response from the public was really overwhelming. We have never seen such levels of uh, donations before. No more handshakes but many more hands being offered. So I started several initiatives to support various vulnerable groups, but what was really amazing was the number of people who volunteered to help. I mean, there were thousands. People really do care. You know, we don't really always need big gestures, but every one of us can do something. During the circuit breaker, I worked as a food delivery rider to raise funds for the CCF, the Children's Cancer Foundation. I felt that if there was a chance to do something to help those who need it, then I should take it because the children there have done nothing to deserve their illness and they have their whole lives ahead of them. No more KTV, but more voices in unison. As my senses tell me. Not content to sit at home, thousands are standing up to be counted. I feel that, you know, in times like that, what can we do to help the country? We have the skill sets as a dentist. We have the know-how. It was a simple decision. 
to help with the national swapping efforts. Even as we go through this very challenging time, in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic, we continue our social responsibility to support and uplift the underprivileged and the vulnerable. To those who have made sacrifices for our sakes. It was a personal decision that I would separate myself from um, the kids and not come too close to them. No hugging, no cuddling. I slept in a different room from my husband. I actually had to stay in a hotel for about four months in order to protect my family. We give back in kind. When anxiety rises, we step up. We shut up the National Care Hotline in 10 days. It was stressful for us, but nothing compared to the stress that some people are facing in this pandemic. The most amazing thing is that I've seen everyone coming in on time and not being late because they knew that they had an important role to play. And when construction stops, we build bridges. Migrant workers are our invisible heroes and they deserve our respect, compassion and gratitude. This year, um, their needs have gone up considerably given what they've endured, but we must press on and do more for them. They are speaking Bangladeshi, I am speaking English. There are no translators at 11 o'clock at night um, and it became really, really hard. So I created a multilingual communications app that uses simple audio and images. It is open source and non-profit so that we can save as many lives as possible. This is who we are today. People, organizations and leaders stepping up against the odds, standing up to be counted and giving our best for others. This is our finest hour, but this is just the start. Can we become the city of good? The answer lies with you. Uh, we created that last year um, for the uh, President's Volunteer and Philanthropy Awards, which, uh, which um, acknowledges uh, many incredible people, uh, I think like yourselves, so uh, I think in, in closing, we just want to um, remind ourselves that it, it is a time to be still. Um, it is a time to shore up our resources, um, internal and external. Um, but it is also a time when we do stand at that uh, nexus, um, looking at the future. And I do so believe that whatever we do in the next two years will determine the trajectory that we take for at least the next 10. Um, and so this is, um, I suppose, our invitation now uh, to really refresh and encourage ourselves um, to shore up, sh up that strength so that we can put our best hearts and minds uh, to doing what we need to do to reimagine and recreate that future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You know, um, I want to thank you for the energy that you put back into this, especially when, you know, for some of us, the energy is flagging. Yeah. It's been a long 20 months for many of us in the healthcare. And um, that, that uh, message of hope that uh, everyone is pitching in, healthcare is pitching in, but non-healthcare is pitching in. Um, I, I think you have just um, really summed up in half an hour the totality of who we are as Singaporeans, non-Singaporeans who live in Singapore now and uh, go through this together. Thank you so much for your, for your wonderful sharing. I, I, I'm very grateful and, and I'm sure the audience is as well. Yeah, mm. I, I have to say, you know, it, there was a choking sensation in me when I saw all the good hearts. You know, uh, people weren't looking at what they didn't have. They were just giving whatever they could, whatever they had. That's truly sharing. Yeah. 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 So now we talk. Yes. Okay. Let's. <laughs> Okay, right. Um, well, I, I do want to um, um, 
say that at CHI, uh, we look everywhere, you know, other settings, other industries, uh, to seek new answers, to look for new ideas and perspectives. Okay. Um, and you know, we are mostly healthcare workers. Yeah. Uh, almost all of us, I would say, right, have come into healthcare because deep, deep down, uh, we really care. And many have cared enough, right, to do some really adverse training, to do even a mid career switch, you know, to join healthcare, to contribute to it. But in a time like this, um, when the going really gets very tough for prolonged periods as well, and, and, and a period marked by uncertainty, right? Uh, there's tiredness, exhaustion for some, yeah? Um, there's also isolation. I think the PPE is one form of isolation in a way, yeah? It's a physical kind of isolation, but there's also relationship isolation. So can you share with us, you know, how do you wake up every day still wanting to do the good that you set out to do? Because that is really what everybody wants to do as well. Yeah. You know, you know it's, it, it's, it's that earliest point, right? Um, you know, the piece around the senses that we need to have, you know, purpose, our sense of perspective, um, which for me, I think is a lot of times is just remembering to be grateful. Um, and then sense of humor, right? Uh, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just, um, and, I, and I think I, the reason why I started with uh, just a, sh a short meditation, and, and I'm honestly the most like, like banyak sibuk, you know, like super busy, whatever, <laughs> run around all the time kind of person, uh, you know, so honestly, being still is a real challenge for, for me. Um, but I know that uh, during this time, unless I prioritize, um, you know, that, that point of, that points of stillness, um, the, 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 re, the refreshing and the recentering, you know, amidst it all, I think I will, I would just fall off the bus and lose the plot. Um, you know, I, I, I remember when I, when I first joined um, NVPC, it was about, well, actually about five months after that, my mother had this huge um, a hemorrhagic stroke and was kind of on life support for a while and I was literally trying to toggle between you know SGH and 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 the office and you know just it was just exhausting and um and uh I remember at that time also just um having like uh, uh work issues and then you know relationship issues and just everything was just falling apart you know and and you know it, sometimes we feel like in those times when everything seems to sort of like fall fall apart that that you just have to um be kind more kind to yourself more gentle <laughs> with yourself and yet be more disciplined to to defend uh that time of 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 and for your own well-being um and so for me um I, I guess I'm just taking some of the lessons I learned during that difficult time too, and trying to put um, just those simple self-care practices, um, you know, into my routine, like religiously, you know, now, whether that's sleep, whether that's, you know, eating well, whether that's like exercise, whether that's doing something restorative, you know, at least once a week and, and trying to just turn off because, I mean, I think, you know, so many of us here are also leaders too, right? And we just feel that there's a responsibility upon us and, and you know, that we, people are counting on us. We can't just, you know, be slack and, and um, turn off. But, but actually, I think to the contrary, I think in, in, until and unless we are um, ourselves restored, um, it's very hard to do that for, for other people too. Um, maybe the point around uh, perspective for me is really also gratitude. My, my grandmother um, is 101, like in two months time, she's going to be 102. And uh, she, for me, is the most uh, exquisite role model. Um, let me just see if I... So this is her with her dog. I don't know if you can see that. So... <laughs> But it looks, she doesn't really. I know, right? It's incredible. What, 80? Oh, yeah. my. 
So she's 101, going to be 100. Oh. And, you know, I always, um, you know, so I always remember what she told me. I, I, I remember she loved, okay, she, she was told to stop driving when she was like 95. Um, but remember when I, when I drove her to her 90th birthday, because she normally likes to drive me, you know, um, I asked her, so what, 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 um, what's the secret to sort of like such a long and healthy life, right? You know, and then she said, hmm, you know, I think it's just, I'm a grateful person. She said, I wake up in the morning and I'm, and I'm just glad I got up. <laughs> and then, and then she said, she said, you know, and I'm really glad. I mean, my grandfather was alive at the time. You know, she said, my, my, I'm really glad that that grandpa can walk to the bathroom by himself, you know? Um, and then I just thought, oh, what a strange mundane thing to say. And then I realized after my mother um, had her stroke that actually walking to the bathroom by yourself is is not something that we should actually take for granted, um, you know. And uh, and so truly, uh, I think that sense of perspective, sense of you know gratitude, um, you know, sense of taking care of yourself, I think is probably the most key thing in these times. Thank you. So what I he really hear from you is, um, if you are caring for people, you need to care for yourself first and foremost. Those little acts of heroism um, doesn't mean that you neglect yourself. Um, and uh, it's not selfish to do so. No, it's the oldest, it's the oldest thing in the book. And we all kind of like know it, but we just we don't, we don't enforce in a sense, and we don't pick up on the habits that we have to stop, <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes to 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 do that. Yeah. Speaking about um, um, you know, facing personal um, setbacks. Mm -hmm. This issue about around losses, um, you know, you asked, what can I not unsee? Mm -hmm. And I cannot unsee being unprepared for death, which has happened in the year, in, in the world around, right? Uh, families have been um, decimated because three or four in the family have been lost to COVID. And uh, this year I lost two two dear people as well. And uh, one, of, uh, the, one of the statements that really touched me was, um, it's worse because you may have to die alone. Yes. And um, for, for those of us who have uh, families abroad, um, you know, sometimes if you're a foreigner in a country, you may not be able to get access to healthcare. And so it's dying alone, really alone without care. And um, what, what is your perspective on this uh, preparedness for death, you know, for, for that, that even we as uh, healthcare professionals, we need to face, and um, because we are seeing, you know, sick people and death around us, sometimes we don't have time to think about our own mortality. No, it's so, oh my goodness, so many thoughts there, actually. I, I, my brother-in-law, uh, lost his grandmother um, during uh, during COVID last year, actually too. And because she was in uh, a, a hospital facility, and the, and her his grandfather couldn't go visit her and go see her actually when she was dying because of all the different protocols. Um, actually, he said, "I'm prepared to go there and die too." You know, if you just let me in. <laughs> Um, but they, but they didn't. That, that wasn't allowed. And you're so right, actually. Just the, the, the emotional toll of uh, of of all of these different losses is so, um, is so profound, actually, and is so scarring, actually. I think for so many um, people, uh, none of us like to think about, um, you know, death or the end and things like that. But I mean, I think the truth is, is that crises um, are extremely clarifying. I think uh, they're extremely clarifying of priorities, um, of trade-offs, mm -hmm. um, of, of, of choices uh, that we uh, made and then can still make. So I think in these instances too, we have to ask ourselves the question, what are the choices that we can now make um, to, to uh, restore the, the humanness, the humanity um, in, in, our, um, 
in our work. I mean, I, I, I did call it still human, really just for trying to again, remind myself, ourselves, um, that, that we have to have humanity uh, in everything that we, that we do. Um, because if we forget that, then I think we've forgotten why, I mean, what this whole thing is about. Thank you. Thank you. I can feel the, the authenticity in your answer and I can really feel this coming from you. Um, and um, I think we hear you um, really reprioritize, really be very clear uh, why we are here and uh, who, who and what is special to us. And we need to look after that. Yeah, thank you. I am going to move on because this is a question I've been dying to ask you. Okay, let's go. All right. <laughs> okay. You know, you have um, a slide that was um, on the project that didn't work when you try to leverage on skills of people and, um, you know, our different strengths. And um, we, we are in this world where, right, big is better. It's always said like that, you know, might is right. Uh, yeah, and we're, we're always uh, chasing um, innovation and novelty. And um, we'll, you know, big organizations can achieve that. But will big organizations and new technology actually potentially strip the satisfaction out of work? Render the worker no more than an anonymous cop in a bigger machinery, or even worse, see the worker as a mere adjunct to, to technology or machine, right? Like AI. And then in contrast, we hear, right? That small is beautiful. Yeah. Um, in fact, this is the title of a book on yeah. essays, right? Uh, by Schumacher on a study of economics as if people matter. Mm -hmm. So really, will small uh, be considered a cool, cool as in deviant actually, right? <laughs> or, or will just will small is beautiful is is it just part of a branding strategy? You know, handmade, handcrafted, cottage industry. Um, so in in big organizations like um, uh, NHG. Yeah, and I'm sure a lot of big organizations elsewhere. We, we have in our jargon, you know, this thing that we need to scale, scale up programs, right? Um, and in our continued growth to care, you know, beyond the individual to a population. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can we truly be person-centered? Can we get back to the human scale? You know, understanding of human need and uh, human relationships and provide care with that understanding? Mm. Or am I just sounding like a, I'm a romantic idea this when I bring up this idea called small is beautiful. What's your take on that? Yeah, well, actually I think that, um, so I, yeah, so I've read some of Schumacher's work, uh, Appropriate Technology and, 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 and mm. so forth. Um, and what he was trying to do was actually appreciate um, uh, appropriate technology, um, things that actually came from an understanding of the, of the operating environment, of how people would uh, um, help, how, how technology and things like that could actually enable people to solve the problems themselves. So it was, it was a form of empowerment technology, actually, uh, too, which I think is is also very um, uh, critical because I think uh, a couple, maybe a couple of thoughts. Um, one is that in our era of you know this, this post-industrial you know kind of like you know time, this fourth industrial revolution, whatever you want to call it, you know, um, actually human the human type of work, human centeredness becomes all the more important. Um, ultimately, it's the human jobs and the human touch that will ultimately last beyond those which can be, uh, um, you know, done by machines, for instance, you know, in the future. So, so, so what it is that differentiates humans, um, a sense of, of care, uh, um, 
person-centeredness, you know, those, those things are empathy, <laughs> you know, for, for others um, are, are, are going to reign ultimately as, as the most important competencies um, in the future. Uh, and, you know, nobody feels really that comforted by a machine. They feel comforted by a human being, you know, at the, at the, end, of the, at the end of the day. Um, and so I think sometimes, you know, we should differentiate what is the purpose of these technologies or, or processes or things. I mean, yes, those, those things can and should make our lives easier. It should help make things more efficient. Um, it should enable us to be more human. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think sometimes we, 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 we don't differentiate between um, scale as just kind of like becoming huge versus mass replicability. I think that's another concept maybe we should think about too, that sometimes you can replicate many, many small things actually, which are highly adaptive to, to, to local contexts and situations, rather than just you know, having the same thing you know, done a million X, for instance. Um, and uh, I mean, I think, I think about sort of small, small things like um, something that I really, really love, actually, this is a, a, a how, how volunteers um, you know, get involved. Uh, um, in, uh, you know, when people are told that they have cancer, for example, um, you know, the doctor has to tell you, so they have to give you your, you know, report, um, you know, but, but after that, um, you know, they, they can't spend that much time with you while you're sort of like, you know, in shocks, you know, with the C bomb kind of thing, right? Um, but but actually, it's very very important where you are at that point, you know, your 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 your, your you know mental state, you know, how hopeful, how positive, you know, you end up feeling, you know, we know is going to affect your 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 chances of recovery, you know, going going forward, right? You know, so. Um, so in this instance, you know, what, what I saw, what was done one time, which is really quite wonderful, is that they created um, a, a, a space, a room for people who had just been told to go, and then they could sit there with a cancer survivor. And this person would be a volunteer whose, you know, job essentially, you know, was just to be with the other person um, who had just been told. And, and, and if you want to talk about it, we can talk about it. If you want to cry, you can cry. If you want to shout and scream, you can shout and scream, you know, and if you just want to sit there uh, and hold my hand, we can do that too, you know. Um, and I think that that's really, you know, one of the most human, um, you know, things that we can do and that, that, that can be largely replicated, but not necessarily scaled per se. And, and replication is about leveraging the, the humanness, the human potential, I think. Um, so if we can do that, I think we would be better off. <laughs> I love that. I love that the distinction that you made between scaling and replicability. Yeah. Uh, and I think that gives us a different way of seeing things, a different perspective as you've challenged us today, right? Um, of uh, how do we get good out to more people? Because ultimately, that's what we want to do. Yeah. I have seen actually... Uh, delightfully that uh, people do pay it forward at the little uh, hawkers uh, that I have visited, that people are actually paying for meals for others who would come by to pick up. And uh, so while you say it hasn't been done, it's failed, it's actually taking root um, in many small uh, holders, uh, people who know their neighbourhood, who know who uh, need so there is a person centeredness and other centeredness that uh, we can see they, they are there as merchants, but yet they are also other centered, especially in times like this. So I guess maybe what I would uh, um, finally take away from this is that really um, small is beautiful and big is better are just opposite poles of polarity. Mm that we just move from one to the other. And um, indeed, we need to hold the two in tension um, and uh, get the best of both. That's right. Yeah. No, that's, that's absolutely right. Because I think, you know, you mentioned too, you know, you know large healthcare groups and, and the rest of it. But actually the one other amazing trend, I think that has just accelerated over COVID is really the purpose-drivenness of business. 
and how organizations you know now are really refocusing on why they exist um, and it, 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 it's necessary to motivate our people. Um, it's necessary to, to stop doing d damage where we may have now discovered we have done damage. Um, you know, and, and it's about, about reaching out then to create the partnerships across all of society to do what actually needs to be, to be done to rebuild um, society better after COVID. Thank you, Melissa. I think it's been my greatest honor to be uh, to chat with you and, and to be seen chatting with you. Uh, and I'm going to hand this back to Hong Tim to end this se session for us. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a blessing for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Melissa and Sweetan. I was just sitting here as I think the rest of our virtual audience is really enjoying the talk very much being inspired by it spoke to my heart and my gut which is not something that that we get a lot of nowadays um, uh, especially in healthcare we are just being inundated with uh, protocols and uh, and uh, things to do so that was nice to have that moment to, to reflect thank you very much all right and as it is now with all virtual events uh, we need to do a bit of a virtual wifi can we do that all right so I'm going to also use this opportunity to thank the crew that's behind me <laughs> can you all see this all right and let's see if we can do a big we feed together as well with, with everybody all right okay. okay look here everyone douglas have you turned on your video i don't think i can i don't think i can but it's okay yeah all right but we can hear you douglas all right okay everyone give a great smile korean love sign yes you got it all right <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, everyone. All right. Fantastic. Okay, great. So thanks again to, to both of you and uh, to our audience, uh, wherever you are listening to us and whenever you're listening to us, we hope you enjoyed that too. Uh, and before you go, I hope that uh, you don't forget to rate today's session. Um, it's a 10 upon 10 for me. And uh, do feel free to drop uh, your comments, uh, as you can see on your screen now. All right. I'll say a final goodbye and thank you to Melissa and Sweet Fun on behalf of CHI. Uh, and I'd also like to tell the audience that we look forward to seeing you at the final segment of CHI Innovate 2021's conference series. Uh, and that's going to happen on the 2nd of December. And we're going to call back and reassemble a panel that we had last year uh, to look at how different global healthcare leaders dealt with the pandemic from their perspectives, from their context and from their societies, their different societal backgrounds as well. So we're going to have familiar faces from Singapore, of course, Hong Kong, Sweden, the UK, and hopefully New Zealand, all different countries who managed and dealt with COVID in very different ways as well. So I hope you can join us for this panel on the 2nd of December. All right, so that's it from us. Uh, until then, uh, in the words of Melissa, really, stay safe, stay strong, and if you can, stay still just for a little while, whenever you can. Thank you very much. <laughs>